Welcome to this webcast on the new insurance contract standard, IFRS 17. Today, we will present part two of our webcast on transition to IFRS 17. This webcast is part of the series of materials that the International Accounting Standards Board is producing to support the implementation of the new standard. My name is Joanna Yeo, and I'm a Senior Technical Manager on the Insurance Contracts Project. My name is Connor Geraghty, and I was a Practice Fellow on the Insurance Project. Before we start, as usual, the views expressed in this presentation are our own, not necessarily those of the International Accounting Standards Board or the IFRS Foundation. A copy of the slides used in this presentation is available for download through the website. Those slides are accompanied by additional material that we hope you will find useful. As a reminder from part one of this webcast, if it is not impracticable to apply the fully retrospective approach, an entity must apply the fully retrospective approach when it first applies IFRS 17. When it is impracticable to apply the fully retrospective approach, transitional reliefs are provided. Those transitional reliefs are for the IFRS 17 requirements that call for past information to fully apply IFRS 17 retrospectively. There are two approaches the modified retrospective approach or the fair value approach. Part one of this webcast discusses when entities might apply either of those two approaches. In this webcast, we will discuss in further detail the transition release provided under these two approaches. We have previously published several webcasts on IFRS 17 to support its implementation. These are all available on our website. This slide shows how this webcast fits in with the other webcasts on IFRS 17. This is part two of our webcast on transition to IFRS 17. In part one, we gave an overview of the transition requirements and is available on our website. We recommend watching part one before watching this webcast. Firstly, we'll discuss further details about applying the modified retrospective approach. The, web, the rest of this webcast assumes that the entity is eligible to apply the modified retrospective approach to a group of contracts. That is, that it is impracticable to apply a fully retrospective approach, and the entity has reasonable and supportable information to apply the modified retrospective approach and chooses to do so. Part one of this, this webcast discusses the eligibility further. As discussed in part one of this webcast, the objective of the modified retrospective approach is to achieve the closest possible outcome to the full retrospective approach using reasonable and supportable information available without undue cost or effort. This approach provides modifications or shortcuts that must be used as specified below. An entity is permitted to use each modification only to the extent that the entity does not have reasonable and supportable information to apply a fully retrospective approach. If the entity has chosen to apply the modified retrospective approach, it must apply the specified modifications when it does not have reasonable and supportable information to apply a fully retrospective approach. To the extent the entity can obtain reasonable and supportable information to apply a fully retrospective approach, it cannot apply the modifications provided. In other words, the modified retrospective approach reliefs are available for the calculations and assessments when the entity cannot obtain reasonable and supportable information without undue cost or effort to support full retrospective application but does have reasonable and supportable information to apply the modifications. We will discuss each of these modifications in the next slide. The modifications specified in IFRS 17 provide relief from having past information needed to apply the full retrospective approach. That is, firstly, the assessments an entity would normally make at the date of inception of a contract or initial recognition of a group of contracts. How to determine the contractor service margin or loss component 
of the liability for remaining coverage at the transition date, and when an entity elects to disaggregate insurance finance income or expenses between profit and loss and other comprehensive income. In other words, the OCI option. The next slides will go through each of these modifications, starting with the first modification on initial assessments. IFRS 17 requires specified assessments to be made at the inception of the contract or initial recognition of a group. Those assessments are whether a contract meets the definition of an insurance contract with direct participation features. For insurance contracts without direct participation features, how to identify discretionary cash flows. And finally, the determination of a group of contracts. To the extent that it is able, an entity should use reasonable and spotable information about the facts and circumstances on the date required by AFRA 17 to make those assessments. When the entity does not have reasonable and supportable information for any of those assessments, under the modified retrospective approach, there are modifications provided. The modification is that the entity should use reasonable and supportable information at the transition date to make those assessments. We will be using the term date of transition or transition date in this webinar. For most entities, the date of transition is the beginning of the annual reporting period immediately preceding the date of initial application. For most entities, this will be the beginning of the annual reporting period beginning on or after 1st of January 2020 and before 2021. Some entities may choose to present earlier prior periods applying IFRS 17. If they do so, the, the date of transition will be the beginning of the earliest comparative period applying IFRS 17. Please refer to part one of this webcast, which discusses this further. Applying IFRS 17, an entity must not include contracts issued more than one year apart in the same group, based on the information at initial recognition of the group. Applying the modified retrospective approach, if the entity has reasonable and supportable information to apply this requirement, it must do so. The modified retrospective approach provides a relief from this requirement when the entity does not have reasonable and supportable information. In this case, the entity shall group contracts that are issued more than one year apart. We now move on to the modifications available where the entity does not have reasonable and supportable information to determine the contractual service margin or the loss component at the date of transition. As discussed in part one of this webcast, determining those amounts requires both past and current information. We will begin by discussing the modifications applicable for contracts without direct participation features. An, an entity must determine the fulfillment cash flows at initial recognition and the movements in the fulfillment cash flows between initial recognition and the transition date to determine the contractual service margin or loss component at the transition date. Applying the modified retrospective approach, there is a specified modification for each component of the fulfillment cash flows, that is, for the future cash flows, discount rate, and the risk adjustment for non-financial risk. In addition to the information about the past and current performer cash flows, the entity will also need to have information about the allocation of the contractual service margin in past periods to determine the contractual service margin at the date of transition. Each of the modifications can only be applied when the entity does not have reasonable and supportable information it would use for full retrospective application, but does have reasonable and supportable information to apply the specified modifications. For example, if an entity has reasonable and supportable information about the discount rates it would use applying a full retrospective approach, it should use those discount rates 
if it does not have such information about the cash flows, but does have reasonable and supportable information necessary to apply the cash flow modifications, it should use the modifications to apply the modified retrospective approach. We will now go through each of those modifications in turn. The first modification is to determine the contractor service margin or the loss component is when the entity does not have reasonable and supportable information to estimate the future cash flows that were expected at initial recognition of a group. The entity starts with the expected future cash flows for the group of insurance contracts at the transition date, or alternatively, at an earlier date, if the expected future cash flows can be, term be determined at that earlier date retrospectively. Then, the entity adjusts those expected future cash flows for cash flows that are known to have occurred between initial recognition of a group and the transition date or earlier date. When adjusting for cash flows known to have occurred, an entity will have to include cash flows for insurance contracts in the group that were in force at initial recognition, but that have been derecognized before or on the transition date. The adjusted amount is then the estimated expected future cash flows at initial recognition. The second modification is for determining discount rates. The discount rates applicable in past periods are needed to estimate the contractual service margin and the loss component on the date of transition, and also if the entity has elected to disaggregate insurance, finance, income or expenses between profit or loss and other comprehensive income. In this webcast, we term this as the OCI option. This slide provides a high-level overview of the modifications provided when the entity is unable to estimate the discount rate for periods before transition using reasonable and supportable information. An entity will first consider if there is um, an observable yield curve that approximates the IFRS 17 yield curve. If there is such an observable yield curve, the entity uses that yield curve. If there is no such observable yield curve, an average spread is applied to an observable yield curve to derive a modified yield curve for application. The next slides discuss these modifications in further detail. Let's start with the box on the left, use an observable yield curve. So how do we determine if an observable yield curve approximates the RFRS 17 yield curve determined under the fully retrospective approach? The entity will make this judgment based on, firstly, determining the IFRS 17 yield curve, and secondly, assessing if there is an observable yield curve that approximates the IFRS 17 yield curve for at least three years immediately prior to the date of transition. For entities with a transition date in 2020, the assessments will be for yield curves at least in the 2017, 2018 and 2019 periods. If the observable yield curve approximates the IFRS 17 yield curve for those periods, then the observable yield curve should be used to determine the discount rates in the periods in which the entity does not have reasonable and supportable information to determine an IFRS 17 discount rate. If there is no observable yield curve that approximates the IFRS 17 yield curve for at least three years prior to transition, then the entity will have to apply the modification discussed in this slide. The modification requires an average spread to be applied to an observable yield curve to estimate an IFRS 17 yield curve for past periods when there is no reasonable and supportable information to construct the IFRS 17 yield curve or use an observable yield curve discussed in the slide immediately before this one. This average spread is determined by considering the IFRS 17 yield curve and an observable yield curve for at least three years immediately before transition. For entities with a transition date in 2020, the assessments will be for yield curves at least in the 2017, 2018 and 2019 periods.
Let's now move on to the modification for the determination of the risk adjustment at initial recognition that is applicable when an entity does not have reasonable and supportable information to estimate the risk adjustment at initial recognition. For this modification, an entity starts with the risk adjustment at the transition date and works backwards to estimate the risk adjustment at initial recognition. The risk adjustment at the date of transition is adjusted for what is expected release of risk of the risk adjustment between the date of initial recognition and the date of transition. The expected release of risk is estimated by reference to the release of risk for similar insurance contracts that the entity issues at the date of transition. The CSM at initial recognition then needs to be allocated based on the transfer of services over the intervening periods between initial recognition and the transition date to determine the contractual service margin at the transition date. When the entity does not have reasonable and supportable information to determine the amount allocated to that intervening period, the entity applies the modification that the allocation is based on the number of coverage units remaining at transition compared to the coverage units provided before transition. Sometimes the entity determines a loss component at the date of initial recognition for a group of contracts that were issued before the date of transition. If that is the case, to determine the loss component on the date of transition, the entity will need to allocate changes in the fulfillment cash flows to the loss component. From the date, the loss component is recognized until the date of transition. The modification is that the allocation of those changes to the loss component should be determined on a systematic basis. We'll now move on to the modifications available for insurance contracts with direct participation features. When the entity does not have reasonable and supportable information to determine the contractual service margin or the loss component at the date of transition, and therefore also insurance revenue after the transition date. When an entity does not have reasonable and supportable information to determine the contractual service margin or the loss component for insurance contracts with discretionary participation features, the entity uses the specified modification. We would explain the modification in three steps. The first step is that the entity estimates the difference between the total fair value of the underlying items and the fulfillment cash flows at the transition date. The second step is that the entity makes the following adjustments. Those adjustments are A, add amounts charged by the entity to the policyholders, including amounts deducted from the underlying items. B, subtract amounts paid that would not have varied based on the underlying items. C, subtract the changes in the risk adjustment for non-financial risk caused by the release from risk. The amounts resulting from steps one and two will either result in a positive amount, a contractual service margin, or a negative amount, an onerous loss, which results in a loss component. Assuming that the result is a positive amount, a contractual service margin, this is deemed a proxy for the total contractual service margin for all services to to be provided under the group of contracts, i.e. before any amounts that would have been recognized in profit or loss for services provided. When steps one and two result in the contractual service margin, step three reduces the total contractual service margin by an estimate of the amount that would have been recognized in profit or loss for services provided between the date of initial recognition and the date of transition. This is done by comparing the remaining units, coverage units at the transition date with the coverage units provided under the group of contracts before the transition date. The amount, this amount after all the steps is the contractual service margin at the transition date. If steps one and two result in a negative amount, that is a loss component for an onerous group of contracts. 
Step three is that the entity will adjust the loss component to nil by increasing the non-loss component of the liability for remaining coverage by the amount of the loss component. As a result, the liability for remaining coverage will not have any loss component on the date of transition. The next two slides discusses the modification applicable when the entity elects to disaggregate insurance finance income or expenses between profit and loss and other comprehensive income, the OCI option. This slide summarizes the modification that is applicable when the entity has established groups of contracts and has reasonable and supportable information to include in a group only contracts that are not issued more than a year apart. If the entity chooses to disaggregate insurance, finance, income or expenses between profit and loss and other comprehensive income or OCI, it will need past information about discount rates to determine the amount of insurance, finance, income or expenses recognized in profit and loss after transition. Also, sometimes the cumulative amount of insurance, finance, income or expenses recognized in OCI on transition. In addition, IFRS 17 requires an entity to use discount rates and initial recognition for other aspects. For example, when determining the contractual service margin, the entity will need to accrete interest using discount rates and initial recognition. If the entity has used the modifications in slide 12 to determine the discount rate at initial recognition, it shall use the same modification for these purposes. This slide highlights those modifications that are applicable when an entity includes in a group contracts that are issued more than a year apart. In this case, an entity does not have the reasonable and supportable information needed to group contracts issued no more than a year apart. An entity may choose to disaggregate insurance, finance, income or expenses between profit and loss and OCI. If so, the amount presented on profit and loss is determined using a systematic allocation. An example of a systematic allocation method is to use the discount rate at initial recognition. In such cases, the modification provided is that the entity is permitted to apply the discount rate at the date of transition to determine the amounts presented as insurance, finance, income or expenses in profit and loss going forward. There are also some reliefs permitted applying the fair value approach. We will discuss these in the final section of this webcast. We assume that a group of contracts is eligible or must apply the fair value approach to determine the contractual service margin or loss component. A group of contracts can apply this approach when it is impracticable to apply the fully retrospective approach and must apply this approach when it does not have reasonable and supportable information to apply the modified retrospective approach. Part one of this webcast discusses these points. What are the additional reliefs when applying the fair value approach on When performing the assessment specified on the slide, applying the fair value approach, an entity may use reasonable and supportable information from either A, the specified past date in IFRS 17, which is either the inception date or the initial recognition date, or B, the transition date to perform the assessments. There is also relief permitted for the grouping of contracts. Applying the fair value approach, an entity has a choice as to whether or not to group contracts issued more than one year apart. However, an entity can only group contracts issued no more than one year apart if it has reasonable and supportable information. We now consider the transition relief that is available for determining the cumulative amount of the insurance finance income or expenses recognized in other comprehensive income or OCI at transition. This is only applicable when an entity chooses to disaggregate the insurance, finance, income or expenses between profit and loss and OCI. If we look at the box on the right for contracts that without direct participation features or 
contracts with direct participation features, but the entity does not hold the underlying items. The entity can choose to determine the cumulative amount in OCI, applying the retrospective approach, or setting it as nil at the transition date. However, an entity can only apply the fully retrospective approach if it has reasonable and supportable information to do so. If the entity does not have reasonable and supportable information, the entity must determine the cumulative amount in OCI as nil. If we move to the box to the green on the left, for contracts with direct participation features, and the entity also holds the underlying items, the entity can choose to determine the cumulative amounts in OCI applying the fully retrospective approach. However, an entity can only do so if it has reasonable and supportable information. The alternative is that the cumulative amount in OCI is set to be equal and opposite of the amount recognized in the OCI relating to the underlying items that the entity holds. This alternative must be applied if the entity does not have reasonable and supportable information to apply the fully retrospective approach. This is the end of this webcast, Transition to IFRS 17, Transitional Relief Deep Dive, which was part two of the webcast on transition. We hope that you found it useful. As stated before, we intend to produce future webcasts and other materials to support the implementation of IFRS 17. Thank you for listening to today's webcast. Thank you and goodbye.